say on May 5th. So your projects are due on May 5th. But if you're going to present money to know that's a Wednesday. Is that right, May 5th is a Wednesday? Tuesday. Or Tuesday. Yeah, if you're gonna present, I need to know by May 4th. I'd like to know before that. Actually, let's say that the previous Thursday I'd like to know. Not just I don't need to know your presentation, I just need to know the actual presentation. Did y'all have ideas about your projects? I think you're thinking really hard about them. Does anybody know what they're going to present or what they're going to write their paper on? Can you share your ideas? Nobody knows at all? On muscles? Okay, that would be really great. So, yeah, a topic that you're interested in and that you're probably going to have a lot of knowledge in. Uh, so, in that way, hopefully it's not a whole lot of work, uh, but something that you want to explore further. Okay, that'll be great. The AI, there's a lot more in there. You know, we've covered a lot about the AI, but there's, of course, there's a lot left that we can go over in depth. Anything else? What are the topics that are interesting? Alex, what is your Okay, there's a lot of great stuff there. We've covered some of it. Anybody else? Topics that you want to cover? You can do it on a sport if you like. Some activity that you like to do. You can do it on some part of the human body or some equipment that you might choose. You can have an athletic trainer or whatever. You can help with various skills that you're going to do. Alright. Be you again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We went to Homa one day. We had a good time. We did not go to Mandeville, unfortunately, because it was rainy the day that we wanted to go camping. All right. Uh, let's see. So we're finishing up about near our uh, image issues or vision issues. And a few more clicker questions we'll do on this chapter, and really just a couple more topics to be done with this chapter. And this chapter will cover our, our next exam, all of that exam. Uh, Let's see, the last thing we did was myopia, which is nearsightedness. Uh, nearsightedness means that you can see close up things, but you cannot see far away things. So the near or the far and nearsighted and farsightedness, that refers to what you can see. So if you're nearsighted, you can see things up close, but not things far away. Now farsightedness, This is also called uh, hyperopia. Of course, this means you can see what things? Near or far things? Far things. So you can see far away things. And uh, the images in farsightedness form behind the retina. It's behind the retina. So does that mean that the eyeball is too long or too short if the image is formed behind the retina? Too short. So with our nearsightedness, our uh, was it myopia, the, the eyeball was too long, it was elongated, and that's the cause of uh, nearsightedness. But for hyperopia or farsightedness, the uh, the eyeball is too short. So if I think about this, here's my eyeball, and instead of being a sphere or instead of being oblong like a near and a nearsighted eye, this is a really short eye. I'm gonna sort of exaggerate it here. And so light rays that come in. You know, the focal point for this lens would be back here. And so what you get on the retina, what you get on the retina is not a nice clear image like you get here, but instead it's a little fuzzy image. 
because the rays aren't all crossing at the same point. Uh, for nearsightedness, if you recall, in order to correct for this, we used a particular type of lens, a diverging or a concave lens. And for farsighted people, we're going to use just the opposite. So we'll use a, uh, a convex lens. This is also called a converging lens to correct it. So if I were to put in this lens, I would put it in here. What it would do is it would sort of cause the light rays to focus a little bit before they go into your eye. And then when they enter into your uh, your lens, it will cause it to focus now at the retina. So it effectively shortens the focal length of your lens. Basically, your lens will, will focus them slightly more. Anybody far-sighted in the class? You are? Oh, we're the only class. So. Okay. All right, so uh, that's farsightedness. You use a convex lens or a converging lens uh, in order to correct that. All right, there are also some age-related problems. Can I go down from here, Yo? Several age-related problems. As we said, it's really pretty remarkable that the human eye lasts for as long as it does, does 70, 80, 90 years that it can last. And it has a few problems along the way. But to have an instrument that lasts that long and does as well as it does is, is not really like anything that we have as far as optical detectors. Um, so some of the age-related problems are presbyopia. Presbyopia. Presby actually means elder. I go to a Presbyterian church, so Presbyterian has the same root. It's a Greek root, and it means that it's elder-led. So, uh, but presbyopia is a condition that old people have. Like, as you get older, your eyes just uh, you become uh, you become more and more far-sighted. So this is just a type of farsightedness. Uh, your near point increases with old age. So you just can't see things up close anymore. It has to do with your lens, that your lens becomes, as it ages, it's, it's difficult to make it switch down in the middle and so that you can see things up close. Remember we talked about the near point, how the near point can be anywhere between like a meter away from you up to about 20 centimeters from your eye. And for us, like, you know, in our 20s or 30s, our near point is pretty close to our eye, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters. But once you get hit over about 40 or so, that near point gradually starts to go out further and further. And so, you know, if you see people that are older and they're holding things out here trying to read the mind, that's because they have presbyopia. So if you ever see anybody holding their newspaper out like this, you can just tell them, hey, you have what? Right. So that just means that their, their lens is not able to, uh, to change shape as well. All right, so their near point increases. Um, we also have astigmatisms. This effect is caused by the lens is not spherical as it should be, 
but instead it's oval. If you think about an oval shape versus a, this is an oval shape versus a spherical shape, notice that the oval shape has a lot of different radii, right? So like from here to here, the radius is pretty short, but from here to here, the radius of this shape is a lot bigger than it was at the shortest point. Whereas for a spherical shape, the radius is constant in all axes, right? But our radius of our sphere is related to what physical quantity of our rim is. Remember, we talked about the different physical uh, points on a limb, like the center of curvature and the focal point. How is the radius of the sphere related to either the center of curvature or the focal point? Okay, so where it lands on the retina is what point? Is that the center of curvature or is that the focal point? Where the light focuses onto the retina oh, is the focal point. Thank you. Uh, so the focal point is also related to the shape of our spherical lens. So we said if we can take our lens and imagine that we're cutting it out of a spherical shape, how is the focal point related to the radius of our sphere out of which we cut our lens? It's half. That's right, it's half. So the center of curvature is the radius of that sphere and the focal point is half that radius, all right? So you can see that if your lens is not spherical, but instead it's oval shape, then you're gonna have all sorts of different focal points for an oval shaped lens because you just have different radii, right? You have a short focal point here, a longer focal point, and a longer focal point. So the effect of that is, is if I have an oval shaped lens, oh, I can't really draw it in 2D here. I'm just gonna, draw it like this, I'm going to tell you this is an oval lens. But the effect is, is that I have rays coming in here, and they're going to focus at the focal point of that position on the lens. Then I have rays coming in here, they're going to focus at a different point, because it's at a different radius. The oval lens has a different radius at that point where the light is coming in. And then I get another ray coming in here, and they'll focus at an entirely different point. And so you get all these different rays that are focusing at different points. And that just makes for a fuzzy image, because you never really have all the rays focusing at a single point. That's an astigmatism, where your lens is oval shaped instead of being spherical shaped. And just makes everything look fuzzy. Um, there are lots of others, like you can also have a, what's called a cataract. And that's just where your lens is clouded over as that comes with age. My dad just had a cataract removed. Probably everybody, you know, people that have had cataracts removed. Uh, the lens just gets really cloudy, but it's really easy to fix. They just go in and they cut it out and they suck that thing out and then it's all good. My dad got a DVD and he did it. Um, yeah, that his eye on. It was really pretty cool. Actually. All right, I have a little video I want to show you. Uh, it just covers these different uh, things, myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. And of course, you should be able to identify them, uh, note how they're corrected, and also um, what causes them. So the shape of the eyeball for hyperopia and myopia. Uh, with presbyopia, that just comes from the lens losing its flexibility as you get older with age, your ear point uh, increases. And astigmatism is just the shape of your lens. And by the way, with astigmatism, you can correct this, uh, but it takes a not just a simple spherical lens, you have to have a lens that has different focal lengths depending upon what light is changing as it goes into your eye. It has to account for the oval shape of your eye, of your lens in your eye to help correct, correct this problem. I think I have a few more questions that we haven't covered uh, from the from this chapter. Let me pull them up.
Let's see. Do y'all remember where we left off exactly? We did the diopters, focal length. Do y'all does anybody keep note of these? No. <laughs> Alright, well maybe we finished these then. I think we did these, is that right? No? This one? Diopters? Okay, we'll go back then a few. I'm pretty sure we've been this one, so let's do these last ones. Alright, so when light enters a medium, it does which of these? As it goes from a vacuum to some other medium, what does it do? Does it speed up, slow down, or does it keep the same speed? I'm going to stop at uh, 50 seconds, 50. Okay, good. When I enter a medium, the uh, light ray will actually slow down. Okay, a virtual image, which of these? Uh, can be projected onto a screen, has a negative image distance, has no magnification, or cannot be seen. A virtual image is which of these? Which of these is true? Remember, we had two types of images, folks. We had virtual images and real images. What defined what a, a real image was? How do we define a real image? Like, for example, this projector makes a real image, right? How do we define, how is that real image defined? Uh, yeah, so a real image can be projected onto a screen. So a virtual image then A is not the right answer. So which of these is it? Does it have a negative image distance? It has no magnification or it cannot be seen for a virtual image. And we have virtual images, like for example, the virtual image that we see in a flat mirror. All right, I'm gonna stop at uh, 135. A lot of you have the right answer now. B is the right answer. It has a negative image distance. Okay, a virtual image can certainly be seen. A virtual image is not what we see in our, uh, our bathroom here. That's a virtual image. Also, you know, with I showed you a concave mirror last time. Remember the one that sort of caves in? That can also produce virtual images. Now it can also produce real images, like with the pig. That's not the pig, right? That's a real image of sorts. It's not exactly a real image, but it's of sorts of a real image. Uh, but it can also produce virtual images, like when you appear upside down. All right, concave lenses produce what type of image? Actually, I don't know that we did this. No, we didn't go over this. All right, uh, the answer here is B, though. Concave lenses only produce virtual images. No, we did do this, actually, didn't we? Well, I'll take that back. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> While you're putting in the correct answer, I just want to remind you that concave lenses are a particular type of lenses, a class of lenses. What is it? Are they a converging lens or a diverging lens? Concave. They're diverging. They're diverging. Uh, remember, they, they look like this. They're sort of caved in. A concave lens looks like this. And so light rays, when they're coming in, the way that the light ray interacts with the glass will cause it to go like this. 
All right. So I cannot produce a, ver a real image with this because in order to produce a real image, I'd have to put it onto a screen over on this side. And because the light rays never cross on this side of the lens, uh, I can never produce a real image. However, I can produce a virtual image. In fact, you know, they do produce images because some of us have them in our eyeglasses. Uh, and my, my virtual image is actually created where these two rays cross back where they, where they, uh, where they cross. So if I were to draw these rays backwards, like this, then I would find that an image would form right there, and that's going to be my first point. It's not a real image because I can't project it onto the screen on this side of the lens, but it, you'll still be able to see it. That's a virtual image, and concave lenses only produce virtual images. That's true for any sort of diverging optical device. How about convex lenses? What type of image do they form? Only real, only virtual, or can they produce either a real or a virtual image? You can ask your neighbor if you're not sure. Oh, let me start the thing. Right, so put your answer in if you've done it already. I just started it. Just a few more seconds, I'll stop at 35. Okay, very good. C is the right answer. It can produce real or virtual images. When I pass around the convex lens, and remember a convex lens looks like this. Right? It's not caving in like the concave lens. Convex lens looks like this. You made two images with that convex lens. Do you remember how you made them? There was one where you had the sheet of paper, right? And I showed the uh, picture of a light on the paper. Yes, remember? And then the other image that you made was like a magnifying glass. And you, you held your finger in front of the image and it made it bigger. Which one of those was a real image? The light, right. So the light is really because it's on a screen, right? It's on a sheet of paper. And which one of those is the virtual image? The magnifying glass. So the magnifying glass, you can't project that onto a screen, and yet you still see it. Right? So the magnifying glass is a virtual image. Right, I think that might be the end. Oh, uh, a convex lens has a focal length of a half a meter. What is its power in diopters? How do we measure the power? Remember, power is a measure of how much does the lens bend the light. And a lens that bends the light a lot will have a high power, and a lens that doesn't bend the light very much will have a low power. I'll stop at 105, 105. Okay, let's see. D is the right answer here. Remember, our power is the inverse of our focal length. You know, you'll have this on your equation sheet, but I, I don't, don't like to think about it in terms of these equations. I like to think about it instead of how much does the lens bend the light. So which of these lenses do you think will bend the light more? The blue one or the red one? Which will bend the light more? The blue one, which is really uh, uh, thin, or the red one, which is wider in the middle? Which one will bend the light more? 
the red one will bend a lot more. All right, so this one, as light comes in, it's going to bend at a pretty short focal length. And this one will bend light a lot less. So its focal length will be out here. All right, so the focal length of this blue lens is right here. Of the red lens, it's going to be like right here. Remember, I, I imagine that I have these spheres that come out. Uh, half of the center of curvature is the uh, focal length. All right, so this one has a small focal point. This one has a big focal point, or a big focal length. All right, so that explains now my, my idea of power as being the inverse. So if F goes down, as it does here, that gives it a big, <coughs> a big power. Whereas if F goes up, as it does for this lens, if F increases, that means that this decreases. So lenses with a big focal length have a small power. Lenses with a small focal length have a big power. They're inversely related. All right, so if I have a focal length of 0.5, 1 over a half is just equal to 2. All right, the focal length is equal to which of these? Half the center of curvature, the point where parallel gray is focused, the center of curvature, or some combination of those. Stop at 50 seconds. 50. Right, let's see. We're sort of all over the board here. Uh, center of curvature is the focal length equal to half the center of curvature. Yes, it is equal to half the center of curvature. Is the focal length also the point where parallel rays focus? Yes, that's the uh, that's why we call it the focal point or the focal rate, because that's the place where parallel rays will focus. That's why we call it the focal point. And since we know it's the half the center of curvature, then it can't be uh, less than the curvature. So the answer here is A. Numbers one and two. And the virtual image has a what image distance? Positive or negative or zero? Uh, I don't remember covering this. Did we cover this? Most of you are getting it right. Uh, you won't see it on the camera that way. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, we can already have this question today. Similar. Yeah. All right. Let's see. I'm going to stop at 50 seconds. 50. It does have a negative image distance. Um, I don't think that's going to come up on the exam. Let me just go to my notes. No, you don't need to know the signs of the focal length or image distance. Questions on this? Still feel comfortable with this chapter? Yeah, Alice. Are these the the lens matrix equation? We got the two. I forget what page that's on, but uh, we're not going to do the lens matrix equation. I think that's everything, though, that we're not doing. But you know, for the exam, focus on the notes.
I would certainly read through the chapters, but I didn't play take any games from the from the reading chapter. We also Uh, we will also, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but we will have a general assessment for the class. Uh, it's going to be at some point in the future, it's going to be for extra credit. We just, for this is a gen ed class, a general education class, so we have to assess the students in this class. So I'll give you a test. Uh, you don't need to prepare for it, but uh, it's like one of your very tough to come on. There'll be a lot of similar things. Then if you get correct on that, we'll count towards up to five points of extra credit. So like if you get a fifty percent on it, you'll get three extra points. If you get hundred percent, you get five points. I'll announce that later. It'll be in the next couple of weeks. Well, it has to be in the next couple of weeks, right? We're almost done. All right, let's move on to electricity. We cover a lot of stuff in this class. Like normally, this class, we would cover these same topics in two semesters of our other physics class. And in fact, in our other physics class, we don't get to sound or uh, often we don't get to fluids or thermal either. We just mainly focus on mechanics and then light and optics and electricity in the other class. Uh, and likewise, with this chapter, we're going to cover a lot of different topics within about electricity. We'll look at potential or voltage that you might have heard of prior. Uh, we'll look at resistors and capacitors and how those things work, as well as uh, potential energy of electrical charges. Um, and then at the end of the chapter, we'll get pretty deep into neurons and stuff, which I'm just learning about. Y'all probably have seen in your classes, but they're kind of cool the way that they do uh, ions in order to transmit information. Are y'all familiar with how neurons work? Yeah, okay. Well, forgive me if I get something wrong, because I'm just learning about them now. But they're pretty complicated. Um, they're very deep, huh? Yeah. I've been thinking about about 12 times so I can understand the words. Um, all right. So, but may, most of this chapter just deals with the physics of electricity and the physics of electrical charges. Um, so this is electrical properties and cell potential. This will be our last chapter. I expect that we'll cover the whole thing. It's not on the next test, but this is the quiz. The quiz on this chapter is on April 28th. I sent an email out. It's on the message board. You forget. I'm going to send another one out, of course. But the quiz for this chapter is on April 28th. I really should have had it this week, but I don't want y'all to come straight back from spring break and have a quiz on Thursday. So. We'll have the quiz next week. Um, all right, so we experience charges every day. Where are some places that you experience charges, electrical charges? When you shock yourself, right? Yeah, so I mean, where do you shock yourself, for example? On metal, like in your in your car, right? So whenever you get out of the car, especially if you have these cloth seats, you rub against the cloth seats and you'll get charges on your body. And then when you go to shut your door, right, you shock your hand. That's why I always, whenever I, especially on a really dry day, when charges are transferred more easily, I always touch the back of my hand of the car first. And then it doesn't hurt as much. Y'all do that too? Or am I the only one? Yeah, mostly. When I put it on the light, I always switch. What do you mean, what? Switch. I always switch. Right. Not because of the electricity that's in the switch, but because it's really dry there. And electrical charges in a humid climate, uh, they bleed off of you more easily. So if you get an excess of charge in a very humid environment like here, because water is a polar molecule, you know what that means? Water is a polar molecule. This means that one side is charged and the other side is charged. Uh, it gets slightly charged on either side. And those polar molecules will take away excess charge. They attract charges. Um, anyway, in humid climates, you don't experience charge as much. But in a really dry climate, like Colorado or Vermont, you do. 
All right. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, I went to a like a boarding school, math and science school. Anybody go to math and science school here? No. Sorry. Anyway, I went to the one in Mississippi. And we would stay up late, right? Because there's a lot of geeky kids that think math and science schools. I know that that shocks you. Right? But there are a lot of geeky kids. And instead of, you know, going out and drinking or partying or whatever at night, they stay up and they, they work really hard learning new things. And it's kind of cool, actually. Anyway, we would stay up really late studying, kind of like y'all do in college now. And uh, I remember I had a roommate, Chris Reese, and he he was kind of dorky in that he went to bed early because he was just a really good student. But he was often in bed early. I remember staying up really late one night and looking over at him, and I was bored or whatever. And so I got up, and I started shuffling my feet on the carpet, and then I went over to him and he was asleep, and I just bring my my finger like right up next to his ear, kind of like. A little spark. I couldn't even see it because it was kind of a dry day and a little spark was jumping from my finger to his ear. And he didn't wake up, he just sort of twitched a little bit. <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing to do when you're bored. But we just experience charges a lot. Of course, we see charges in electrical devices, and we'll talk a little bit about that in this chapter. Uh, we have a lot of charges in our body, and we'll talk about the cell potential and the action potential of our neurons and how they use those charges to, to transmit information through our through our nervous system. Um, electric charge has some properties. You probably know what they are. It's sort of first grade stuff. But let's go over them nonetheless. Um, it's a fundamental property of matter. Electrical charges. All right, so it's fundamental property like, for example, mass. Everything has mass, everything has charge, right? Everything has a mass and everything has a charge. Kind of like everybody has a belly button. That's sort of a funny, fundamental property of people. Uh, but it's a fundamental property of matter. Uh, the fundamental unit of charge Is called E, and one E has a value of one, uh, excuse me, one point six times ten to the minus nineteen coulombs. Coulombs is the unit for charge. And we abbreviate this as a capital C because it refers to a person. What this means is that every charge that we have is has this basic fundamental unit. Anybody ever seen this number before? Know what it refers to? 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. It's a pretty important number. What does it refer to? The charge of what? What particle? What type of particle has a charge that's equal to that value? It's a subatomic particle. The electrons have that charge. Another particle also has the exact same charge. So what is that? But opposite. What has a charge that's equal but opposite to the electron? The proton. Right. So, uh, so the electron and the proton both have this. So if I have one proton, it has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. If I have one electron, it also has that charge, but negative opposite that. All right, so that's our fundamental unit of charge. You can't have, or let's see, so uh, actually, we'll come back to that can't have. So this is the charge of a proton, <coughs> an electron. has negative 1 E charge, a proton has 1 E charge, and then if you have a whole bunch of electrons or a whole bunch of protons, it's going to be some factor of this. Right? Um, for a neutron, what is the charge of a neutron? Right, it's, n it's a neutral particle, so its fundamental property of charge is that it has no charge, so it ha it's not electrically charged at all. Can I go down from here, y'all? All right. All atoms are charged. 
or rather all atoms have charges. But most are electrically neutral. How can it be that an atom has charges, but it's still neutral? It's Amy's birthday today. Sorry about that. How can atoms have charges but still be electrically neutral? Come on, y'all are in the second grade, right? How does that happen? Right, I have equal number of protons and electrons. So if in an atom I have, say, three protons here, what's that, lithium, I think, and then I have three electrons that are orbiting. So this atom is electrically neutral, even though it has charges at a subatomic level. Most, most are electrically neutral. Those that aren't are called ions. We have two types of ions. Uh, this will become important when we're talking about cell potential. But cations are positive. And anions are negative. Right? Typically, how would I make, say, this lithium atom positive? Let's do it as a quick question. How can I make this lithium atom positive? Typically, would I add a proton? Take away an electron? or add a neutron. Typically, how would I make this lithium atom positive? Or not typically. Always. How would I make this lithium atom to have a net positive charge? Would I add a proton, take away an electron, or add a neutron? I'm going to stop at uh, 30 seconds. All right, the right answer here is B, y'all, because if I add a proton to a lithium atom, what happens to it? It's not lithium anymore. It's whatever's after lithium. What's after lithium? I don't know either. Whatever comes next, right? That's the periodic table. Each element uh, has an increase of one proton. Right, hydrogen has one, helium has two, lithium, I think is number three, is that right? Is lithium third? Yes. It's, yeah, three. What's after that? Okay, yeah, you've exhausted my knowledge of chemistry at lithium. So, all right, um, but the lithium atom becomes positive by not adding a proton, because then it would become beryllium, I guess, uh, but taking away an electron. That's a general thing that whenever I'm talking about charging things, I'm always talking about the motion of, of electrons. Very seldom do you change the charge of something by adding protons. And we'll see that later when we talk about the human body, because the human <coughs> body uh, will, can become charged, and that's because you're adding electrons. Likewise, with electrical current, we'll talk about the motion of electrons. Just in general, protons, they don't move around very easily, because they're very tightly bound into the nucleus. It's not going to move around very easily at all. But electrons, on the other hand, can move very easily, uh, depending upon the type of material. All right. Um, charge is quantized. This is another property of charge. A charge is quantized uh, that means that if I have a charge it's equal to plus or minus one times E. That would be one proton or one electron plus or minus 2 times E. That would be 2 protons or 2 electrons. Plus or minus 3 times E. 3 protons or 3 electrons, and on and on. So let's say that I had some charges. 
And I want you to tell me which one of these charges is not correct. These are all in coulombs. Which one of these charges is not a physical charge, like cannot exist, does not exist in nature? Which one of these charges? The charge that is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, 3.2, 5.4, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Based on this idea that charge is quantized, charge comes in particular quanta, that's what it means, particular quantities that are discrete and you can't have quantities in between. So which one of these charges then is not an appropriate charge, is not correct? I'm going to stop at uh, 110, 110, so just five more seconds. All right, we're sort of all over the board here. Uh, well, let's see. So these are all protons or electrons first? Mm, they're all what? No, they're all protons. If they were electrons, uh, they would all be negative. All right. Um, so these are all protons because these are all positive. This is just one proton. Okay. One proton has that charge. How many is this one? That one's two protons. How many is this one? This is four protons, right? Four times 1.6, 6.4. 6 and so how many is this one? Well, this is like three point something, right? It's three, three protons plus a little extra. And you can't have that little extra because charge is quantized, right? It comes in discrete quantities and you can't have something in between. You can't have half a proton or half an electron. All right, so C is the right answer. You want to see our pictures from the break? Take a little break. Okay, do you care? Course. I don't have many pictures, but we went geocaching in Homa one day, so I have pictures from that, since you care so much. Uh, Y'all know what geocaching is, right? I told you what geocaching. Well, Homa has this thing in Terrebonne Parish, which we've really come to like, where they have about 30 caches that are spread all over the parish. And if you collect 20 of them, you get like a little prize. It's just like a little geo coin that has Terrebonne Parish blah, blah, blah on it. Uh, but if you find 20 of them, then you get this prize. But also, it takes you on a tour of Terrebonne Parish and sort of all the cool things that are in it. So you, like, you get to go, I don't know, down to Bitnep or whatever, or no, Lumcon, excuse me, and all over Homa and Mechanicville. I didn't even know Mechanicville existed. Do y'all know what Mechanicville is? It's like south of Homa a little ways or east of Homa or something. But anyway, all sorts of cool things, museums that you get to go to, and old, old uh, Victorian mansions. So, like, this is the visitor center down at 90 and uh, 24. My kids are dressing up as Gandalf. There's one there that we went to see. Uh, I think that was, I think that was a South Down. We went to South Down. Yeah, that was a South Down. So there's the cache right there. It was up in that tree. Uh, this one, I think, oh, this is at Veterans Park, I, not Veterans Park, but on Homa over, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know the name of the road. I have another picture I'll show you in a second, but there's a bridge that goes over the bayou. Is it 311? Yeah, where they have the big Vietnam veterans thing. Yeah, where this thing is in Terrebonne Parish. This was at the Military Museum. There's a cache hidden underneath this gun. Right. This big gun is pretty cool. I'm very excited to find it. Ada found it. Actually, I found it. Mm -hmm. right. But then I let her think that she found it. So, just to be clear. Oh, and this was one. 
There's supposed to be one at the government tower in Homa. It's supposed to be back in these uh, Sago Palms, but it wasn't there. So I told the kids to look really sad. They look sad to you? Yeah, they were supposed to look really sad. But they couldn't find it. Oh, that's me and my girl. Oh, and this is at the Water Life Museum. The Water Life Museum? Or the Folk Museum, I forget. This is Water Life, I think, right? In between the bayou? Or right next to the bayou, yeah, the red one. Anyway. It's a fun series, so if y'all ever get into geocaching, if you have a smartphone, you can do it. It's real easy. There are even some free apps that you can download to let you do it. All right. All right, let's get back to business. All right. Uh, one other property of charge. Charge is quantized. That's a property. The other factor, uh, property of charge, is that charge is conserved. <clears throat> That just means that you can't destroy charge. Or create it. Uh, but that to make things charge, you just move them around. So when something is charged, Just due to uh, the movement of charges. So, for example, next time I'll show you, we'll, we'll become negatively charged, uh, and that won't be due to to actually creating negative charges and putting them on my body, but instead moving them from one place to another. Because you can't destroy or create charges; you can only move them around. That's a, sort of a basic property of charge, that charge is conserved. Now we're going to go through this series where we'll, we'll go through electric forces, and then we'll look at electric potential energy, and then we'll look at electric potential. And we're sort of building up to this electric potential, but it all starts with electric forces. So we're going to start with that. Can I go down from here, Neil? We just sort of map this out for you, though, before we get into it. We're going to go from forces. If I have electrical charges, they experience a force. And then we'll go to potential energy. Whenever I have charges that are next to one another, they'll experience some amount of energy. Uh, we'll also see here fields sort of in parallel. Fields are, are simply a measure of the force per charge. It's just a way that we describe the electric force. You might have heard of electric fields, or you might have heard of magnetic fields as well. They're very similar. Magnetic and electric fields work in about the same way. Uh, so we'll go from forces to potential energy and fields, and then we'll finally end with the idea of electric potential. All right, this is a measure of energy per charge. And you might have heard of this called not potential or electric potential, but you might have heard of this called voltage. All right, so it's a pretty important concept when we're talking about electrical devices, particularly. And also in the human body, when you're talking about the cell potential, which y'all might have heard of in your anatomy class, that cell potential is this. It's an energy per unit charge. And it's measured a measure of voltage. It's measured in volts. So we'll see all these terms, and they're sort of mapped out here. They're kind of confusing when you first see them, especially if you haven't seen them before. Uh, but they do really harken back to what we've done in the previous part of the class on energy and forces and what have you and work. Uh, first of all, electric force. So we observe electric forces. For example, if you ever see anybody that's really charged and their hair all stands up like this, have you ever seen anybody like this? Yeah, I'm going to bring our Van de Graaff generator next time and we'll get to do this. It's really pretty cool. The reason that your hair stands up is because you have these negative charges 
that are on the tips of your hair, and they're all experiencing electric forces. So they have a force that keeps them apart from one another because they repel. Light charges will repel. So we observe these electric forces all the time. And in fact, in electrical devices, in circuits in our homes and, and in our cell phones or whatever, there are electric forces that cause those electrons to travel through whatever path you have designated for, the, for them to travel through. And that's sort of the basic idea for electrical circuits, that you have these electric forces that will cause them to move through uh, a circuit. Whenever you have an electric force, it requires two or more bodies. Remember Newton's three laws? The first law was the law of inertia, the second was the law of acceleration, and then the third law was that action-reaction law. Which of these, which of those laws is represented here? That in order to have an electric force, I have to have two or more bodies. Which of those, the first, second, or third law? That is, if I have a force, that I have to have two or more bodies. What do you think? Listen, you know what I like about this class? Huh? It's the action reaction. I was going to say what I like about this class is that I like how y'all are unafraid to answer. Even though, like, students get it, uh, the answers wrong all the time, right? Like, has anybody ever gotten an answer wrong in this class? Yeah, I really like that about this class, that, that y'all are willing to answer questions, even when you get them wrong. Because a lot of students wouldn't like that, right? But I really like that about y'all. But that's right, action reaction that this is an extension of Newton's third law, or an application of Newton's third law. So when you think about this, you can think, ah, that's Newton's third law. That if I have one force, I have to have an opposite force. So I have to have two or more bodies. Uh, it turns out, this was found experimentally. It's called Coulomb's law. That the electric force between two charged bodies is given by this. It's equal to uh, some constant, this k, doesn't really matter what it is. Q, Q, this is Q1, this is Q2. We're going to take the absolute value of these divided by the distance squared. So if I have two charges, say plus Q minus Q here, the distance between them we'll call R, and uh, the forces then. I'll have one force on this particle. I'll have another force on this particle. You probably know this, but let me write it out. Opposite charges attract. On the other hand, like charges repel. You all aware of this? So here I have two opposite charges. <laughs> They're going to suck together. If I have two positive charges, a plus Q and a plus Q, these two charges will feel forces that are opposite one another. All right, but the magnitude of that force is given by this. So let's do a quick question. Let's say that I have a force equal to two newtons or whatever on two charges. In reality, when you're talking about charges, they're going to have forces that are much smaller because they have such a small mass, if I put two newtons on an electron, man, it would have an acceleration of V out of this world, literally. So their forces on, on subatomic particles are actually much smaller than a force that we might experience. Well, let's say that I have a force of two newtons. Let's say that I increase the distance from two meters to four meters. I go from two meters to four meters. What is the new force on these charges? Is it still two newtons? Actually, hold on, I'm sorry. Is it zero newtons? Is it a half a newton? Is it 2 newtons? Is it 4 newtons? Or E, is it uh, 8 newtons? 
which of these is it? If I increase the distance from 2 to 4 meters, I have these two particles. They were 2 meters apart, and now they're 4 meters apart. How do I affect the, uh, the force on those particles? Remember, looking at this relationship, I'm changing my distance by a factor of 2. So I'm increasing the distance by a factor of 2. And now I want to know what happens to the force. A lot of you have the right answer, but some of you don't. I want you to think about, is the force, when I pull these particles apart, is that force going to increase or will it decrease? And then if you say that, you get rid of some answers. Is it going to increase or will it decrease the force between these two charges? If I pull them apart, will that force increase or decrease? All right, I'm going to stop at uh, 1.30. 1.30. Just a few more minutes, I'll hand back your quiz, OK? Just hang in a little bit longer. All right. Is the is the force going to increase or decrease, y'all? When I pull these things apart, it's going to decrease, right? Because this I. If I uh, if I increase this value r, that means that this guy is going to get bigger or smaller, right? So if I have uh, if I'm going from 2 to 4 meters, that means that I'm increasing this value by a factor of 2. R is increasing by a factor of 2. But R is squared. So that means I get a factor of what in the denominator? I get a factor of 2 squared, which is 4. John, that's not even important. Because if you've already established that the force decreases, then you're only left with these two options. Because this is the same as the force. This one's bigger, and then the other one's 8 or 16 or whatever, but it's bigger too. Uh, and so you ask, well, is it zero or half? And you know that the force doesn't go to zero, because in order for the force to go to zero, this value, r squared, would have to go to what? No, not zero. They have to go to infinity. They would just have to go so far apart that they don't even know they exist. All right. So uh, it has to be that one half here. So I get a factor of four. This is 2r squared. That means I'm going to have my original force divided by 4. So that's 2 newtons divided by 4, which is 0.5 newtons, or a half of it. All right? You might see some problems like that, just sort of asking if I change different things, uh, how will it affect the force? So for example, if I increase the magnitude of one of the charges, say by a factor of 2, what will that do to the force? If I make one of the charges bigger, say it was 2 coulombs and I make it 4 coulombs, how does that affect the force? Does the force increase or decrease? It increases, right? So if I increase the magnitude of one of these charges, say I increase this by a factor of 2, that's going to increase this force over here by a factor of 2 as well. We'll do some more quicker questions next time, sort of addressing this. It'll come up also with potential and electric fields as well. In your book, they calculate the force between atoms. I'm going to do that, and then I'll hand your quiz back. Uh, of course, you won't have any calculations on your exam there, but just sort of for demonstration. They look at two carbon atoms, and for a carbon atom, I have two carbon atoms here. Uh, carbon atom, the, uh, the charge on a carbon atom is plus 6E. And the distance between them is 0.5 nanometers. Uh, and then they find that the force, just doing this K Q Q over R squared, that the force between these atoms is 3.3 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. That means that I have a force, if I have two positive charges, 
I have forces that are on these atoms uh, that have a value equal to this. Again, you're not going to have to calculate the force for these charges, but just to sort of show you that these charges, they experience forces that are very small. That's what's important here. And they also have separations that are very small. A nanometer, that's like one over ten. Let me hand your quizzes back. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the uh, solution for that quiz. So if you like, you can just go ahead and mark the correct answers. I'll take this way off. If you just go to the website, go to uh, old quizzes, it's quiz five. Make sure this is still the same. No quiz on Thursday. No, the quiz is uh, April when? Y'all know? 28th. 28th, right. That's. And is it in two weeks from today? Yeah. Seriously, what was I thinking? Oh, okay. oh, that's why. Yeah. Because our next test is is on Tuesday. It's in one week. All right. There's no quiz on Tuesday. Right. There's a test on Tuesday. It's on the I chapter. On the I chapter, right. Oh. All right. So these are the uh, answers. Let's see. Patrick. Thank you.